Hi, um, my name is Megan Alt. I'm the executive director of the Duke Law Innocence Project, and I'm so happy to see a full room. Um, thank you all for being here today for our Ghost of the Innocent Man event. Um, on behalf of the Innocence Project, I want to issue our thanks to the Duke Bar Association for their sponsorship of this event, uh, to Sarah Holzapple for her help in putting it together, and to our professors, uh, Professor Coleman, uh, Newman, and Jamie Lau, um, who all have been great supporters of the Innocence Project here at Duke and are just doing inspiring work on their own. Um, for those of you who have not had a chance to read Mr. Racklin's book yet, <laughs> it will be available after our talk outside. I guess it's available now, but don't run out there. Um, <laughs> during the discussion today, Q&A cards are going to be handed around um, there. And if you have a question that you want our guests to answer, we'll collect them. And then around um, 1.15 or so, I'll uh, read a few, and we'll get to hear their responses. Um, our first guest to my left is uh, author Benjamin Racklin. Uh, Mr. Racklin grew up in New Hampshire and studied English at Bowdoin College, where he run, won the Sinkinson Prize. Uh, Mr. Racklin then joined the writing program at the University of North Carolina, Wilmington where he won the Schwartz and Brower Fellowships. While at UNC Wilmington, Mr. Racklin began working on the story of Willie Grimes, an innocent man who was sent to prison for a rape that he didn't commit. That story grew into the book that we're here today to discuss, Ghosts of the Innocent Man. The book chronicles Mr. Grimes' story and that of activists and policymakers on the outside as they worked to establish the North Carolina Innocence Inquiry Commission. <laughs> Ghost of the Innocent Man has been called a powerful, unsettling account of an overdue legal movement and a story so important and infuriating, it's hard to look away. So we're very grateful that you're here to discuss the story with us today. Joining Mr. Racklin is Mr. Willie Grimes, the exoneree at the center of that story. Mr. Grimes, we're honored to have you here at Duke. Um, we're so very sorry <laughs> for your years of wrongful imprisonment, but we're so happy you could be here to share your story with us today. Uh, we can't thank you enough for being here. Can we start with an applause? Yes, I would love that. <laughs> Please do. Um, and finally, our third guest is Mr. Grimes' attorney, Chris Muma. Ms. Muma is executive director of the North Carolina Center on Actual Innocence, a friend of the Duke Law Innocence Project, and mother of a Duke Law 1L. Uh, her role in fighting on behalf of Mr. Grimes and others who have been wrongfully convicted is prominently featured in the book. So thank you all for being here. I'll turn things over to Mr. Rackla now. Hi, thanks to Megan. Thanks to all of you guys for, for coming out in the middle of the day. I want to thank um, not only Megan for that generous introduction, but also to the Innocence Project here um, for the great work they do and for the work they've done to, to make this event happen. And also to the Duke Law School more generally, not only for being sort of warm and gracious hosts, but also because um, as Megan mentioned, I was here several years ago to conduct interviews on behalf of the book with some of uh, your faculty members who I was very impressed with. And so it's a privilege to be back here under these circumstances and to share a stage with these guys. I thought I'd tell you a little bit about how the book came to be and then uh, I'll basically get out of the way and uh, let you hear from the two more interesting people <clears throat> here on the stage. In very early 2013, I was 26 years old and living down in Wilmington. And I came across this tiny headline in a local newspaper about this man who'd been wrongly convicted, spent 24 years in prison, and just been exonerated. I'm in the middle of three brothers, and the age gap between me and the youngest is two years. And so my brother was 24. And so I knew exactly how long 24 years was. He'd spent my brother's entire lifetime wrongly behind bars. And I became obsessed with these questions of, who is this guy? Uh, what was, how was he convicted wrongly? What was that like for him? Who were these lawyers who'd finally proved he was innocent? Um, and how'd they, how had they done it? And also, what was his life like now? It turned out that... Um, in 1987, uh, this man named uh, Willie Grimes was living in this town called Hickory, North Carolina, which some of you might know is about an hour northwest of, of Charlotte. Uh, one October night in 1987, uh, an assault 
was conducted well across town. A, a, this unfamiliar man knocks on this woman's door, forces his way in, conducts uh, an assault, and then vanishes into darkness. Willie that night was well across town at a house party with many of his closest friends. Every one of those people later testified on behalf of his alibi, signed affidavits. He was with them. There was no way he could have possibly committed this crime. Besides which, um, you know, they knew who Willie was, and th there was just no way that he was the kind of person who, who would do something like this. Nonetheless, Willie was convicted and sentenced to life in prison. Over the course of the following decades, he was repeatedly offered parole early if he would <clears throat> uh, confess to the crime and show remorse and take responsibility, which Willie again and again refused to do. He said that um, he hadn't committed any crime, and so to uh, confess to something he hadn't done amounted to lying, and he couldn't do that. And this comes not just from um, Willie, but from Willie's court records. Uh, Willie waived attorney-client privilege on my behalf, and so I have access to his records from inside prison, where again and again his supervisors uh, make notations to the effect of, spoke with Willie, offered this program, uh, he refuses to take responsibility, parole denied. <clears throat> it also turned out that the people who had gotten Willie out of prison were a fascinating story in themselves. While Willie was imprisoned, unaware of his case in particular, but after a string of high-profile cases in the state, a kind of summit was called, bringing together some of the top legal minds from around North Carolina, representing every conceivable perspective on the criminal justice system, prosecutors, defense attorneys, judges, law professors, victims, advocates, police. They got in a room in Durham in 2002, and they looked at each other and they said, we've got a problem. We're convicting some of the wrong people, and we've got to do something about it. That something became <clears throat> uh, an unprecedented state agency called the Innocence Inquiry Commission. It is the only agency uh, of its kind in the country, empowered independently to conduct post-conviction um, investigations. Inmates can write to them uh, and say the outcome in my case was wrong, and they're a neutral fact-finding agency that can take a, a serious hard look at cases where according to the criminal justice system, they've been resolved, but some element of doubt exists about the verdict. Um, when I share that fact with folks from outside North Carolina, perhaps you'll forgive me for saying that I often get surprised that um, a state uh, with sort of the current politics of North Carolina could be responsible for uh, the first and only agency of this kind. And my, what I tell them is that North Carolina is home to an extraordinary collection of individuals, some of whom are on your faculty, and one of whom is this woman named Christine Muma, who came to the law uh, a little bit later in life as uh, in a second career, and whose conscience just refused to accept the reality of the law as she found it. After law school, she clerked, and then she went to work uh, pro bono on behalf of men and women who she believed were incarcerated wrongly. But after years of dead ends uh, and hard work, she referred his case to the Innocence Inquiry Commission, the state agency that she had helped found, and it conducted the investigation that no one else, not just in North Carolina, but around the country, was empowered to. And uh, through its process, it proved Willie innocent in a court of law. Um, in October 2012, which was just a few months before I encountered his case in a newspaper. So the book tells the sort of intimate story of both these threads. On the one hand, Willie and his experience being wrongly convicted and finally exonerated. And on the other hand, this exceptional collection of lawyers and this unprecedented state agency uh, they helped to create in alternating chapters until those two stories converge. And it does so in this context. In 2012, the year Willie was exonerated, a new national record was set, the number of exonerations in America. That record was broken in 2014. It's been rebroken every year since. Uh, we now average almost 200 exonerations a year in America, which is about three a week. 
Just this spring in March, we, we had our 2,000th exoneration since we began tracking these things. Since 2011, the, number of exoneration, the rate of exonerations annually has more than doubled. And every one of those represents a man or woman or adolescent like Willie from whom months or years or decades are taken. And everyone who studies this agrees that we have just barely scratched the surface. This, this trend uh, isn't slowing, it's accelerating. But it was very important to me to write a book not about some sort of abstract issue, but about the real people on the front lines who, who were living this. And it's a total privilege to be sitting with two of them today, Willie Grimes and Chris Muma. So I thought that, uh, Willie, I thought you could start us off. I wanted to ask, can you, let's, can you tell us about your life before 1987? Can, can you, t what kind of person were you, what was your life like before police ever knocked on your door? Well, I was working in Hickory for a pretty good while, right before I moved to Hickory. My muscle got sick, and I got mad for some reason, just, <laughs> just to have someone there with mama because I couldn't be there with her. And after I got married, I was still working a job, my was two jobs. Well, working full time and part time on another job. And four months later, my mother died. And uh, I still was working in Hickory, which became a problem at the time because I guess my wife wanted me to stay home with her and this and that, and I told her we couldn't make a living if I stay home with her because we wouldn't have no income. We kept on, I kept on working, so eventually me and her parted about four months later. She went to D.C. So I was there for about another year and I quit my job and went to D.C. to try to maintain things with her, which when I got up there, problems was up there because I think she was seeing another man in this and that, so I came back and went to work in that Hickory Frame in 1978 on up to 1984. During that time, I got two of my fingers cut off on the job. But they wanted me to come in just to sit around. They would pay me for it because they didn't want the insurance or whatever to have to pay too much. So I did that. So eventually they had, had to move to another part of town, which was kind of and I went to DHJ then and went to working as a dietary operator and this and that. And I still was holding my other job at the country shop, which was a cop, copper place, putting copper on water lines and things like that. I had, had been working there for about two and a half years and on the other job, DHJ, about four years. And when I got off from work on October the 27th, I came home. I was living with a lady named Brenda Smith. She told me that the police had been there looking for me. I asked her for what? And she said, I don't know, they wouldn't tell me, but they looking for you. So I didn't eat or anything. I said, oh, well, why don't you carry me to the police station? I need to find out what they want. Because I know I haven't did anything for them to be looking for me. So I went up to the police station, asked them, and they said, well, we don't 
know nothing about it, but Steve Hunt supposed to have some warrants. They turn them over to Steve Hunt. And he'll be here in about 10 minutes. So I waited till he got there. And he came in with telling me, and I told him, I haven't did anything. And he said, oh, it's best for you to be quiet because you is in a lot of trouble. I said, but I haven't did anything. I know I haven't did anything. He said, really best for you to be quiet. I said, well, I take a lot of tips to do anything you want me to do because I know I haven't did anything. He said, well, this is the last time I'm telling you, you best be quiet because you're in big trouble. So at that time, I got quiet. And he t told them, the jailer, to fingerprint me and lock me up. So that's what they did. Two days later, I went to court for a hearing and got a court appointed lawyer. A week later, we went for the primary hearing, the seated the lady or whatever know me, or did she remember me? And at the hearing, they asked her, and she said, I don't know. It looked like him over there, but I don't know if that's him or not. So he locked me back up, waiting on cry. I waited nine months in jail. My lawyer came to see me a few times. Made me mad because he wouldn't come in but once every three, two or three months. So I said, this lawyer ain't doing nothing trying to help me. I need another lawyer. So I went through writing the court trying to get another lawyer and this and that, but they said they had to appoint it, me the lawyer, and I have to accept what they appoint. But he was young, solid young, and didn't act like he knew too much about law and this and that. I was much older than he was. <laughs> so. Uh, did you have an expectation for what would happen at trial? What did you think the outcome would be? When I first got locked up, I thought they would call the witnesses to court because he had went and got affidavits from all of them and this and that. And I was looking to just go to court that day and go on back home. But that turned into 24 years. One of the serendipities about this story is that, Chris, you and Willie first interacted meaningfully with the law about the same time. Willie was convicted in July of 1988, and you had an experience at a trial that same summer uh, that was from a few. Can you tell people who James McDowell is? Uh, James McDowell was um, charged with the murder of Doris Gilly in uh, Durham, and I was uh, called to jury duty for his trial. That was a, a capital case, so he's being tried with the death penalty um, when I was pregnant with my first child. Yeah, I was going to ask who were, and we should clarify that James McDowell was not wrongly convicted. No, he was not wrongly convicted. <laughs> he, he, he admitted to the, the murder. It was uh, the circumstance of the murder that was important. Who were you then? What kind of person was getting called to jury duty? I was, um, I graduated from Carolina with a business degree with a uh, focus in finance. And I was the uh, director in finance for Northern Telecom, a telecommunications firm in uh, RTP. So how does, a, how does a young business executive track person become uh, a lawyer who works primarily on wrongful conviction cases? So you, you mentioned the word serendipity, and I'm, I'm a big believer in serendipity or divine intervention or karma or whatever it is that happens that brings people together uh, in certain ways. 
And um, that murder trial, I, when I was a juror, I had never really, I had not really thought about criminal justice. I had not thought about the death penalty. Um, I was very naive um, about a lot of things um, that happen in our society. And um, it kind of triggered my interest. I also worked uh, in the in connection with law in that I was doing contract law as part of my job. Um, in uh, 1994, uh, after my third child, who's staying, sitting right there, uh, Madison. Hello, it's Madison. Um, you, you have my sympathy for that. I didn't, that wasn't my idea. <laughs> um, after she was born, um, it, Northern Telecom wanted me to move to Canada. And I decided I didn't want to do that. And I was interested in the law from a contracts perspective and thought I would do uh, business law and decided to go to law school. Um, during my third year of law school, I did a 10-year uh, retrospective paper on my experience as a juror and uh, went back and interviewed my fellow jurors and the judge <laughs> and the defense attorney and the prosecutor with 10 years of, of thinking about this case and what had happened. Um, and then I clerked at the um, Court of Appeals and then the Supreme Court, I clerked for I Beverly Lake. And I Beverly Lake became the Chief Justice of the North Carolina Supreme Court. And as Chief Justice, he had responsibility for the court's budget and financial situation and had zero financial knowledge. And the serendipity part is that because of my financial background and that I was uh, slightly older than the average clerk, um, I kind of took on a different role with him and helped him with the, the financial uh, analysis for the court system. And um, like I said, I stepped out of the normal clerk, traditional clerk role. And we became very good friends. And um, he, he grew to trust me. Um, and uh, as Chief Justice, his focus was public confidence in the court system. And um, when I finished clerk, during my clerkship, there were two cases in particular that I worked on where I believed the jury got it wrong, that the evidence did not support the verdict. Uh, and I went to the justices to talk about that and was, was very quickly told, that's not our problem. That's not our jurisdiction. Um, the, the, the jury finds guilt or innocence on the facts. We're here to look at the legal issues. Um, and that really uh, troubled me. So I spoke with my criminal law professor, and, and you're, you, know, you need to get to law, know your, your law professors. They will be connections for you for the rest of your lives. Um, I spoke to my criminal law professor, who was Rich Rosen, about these cases. And um, I had job offers at that time to go into corporate law to do corporate work. And um, I talked to Rich Rosen about these cases, and he uh, encouraged me to come work with him and Jim Coleman and Teresa Newman um, uh, doing innocence work. And so I had a complete change in course, which is, would be my other piece of advice, is don't set yourself into something and decide that that's what you have to do and that you can't change course mid-course, because you can always change course. Um, and that's how I came to do wrongful convictions work. I want to ask you in a moment about <clears throat> those meetings that, that um, you and Beverly Lake and Teresa Newman and Jim Coleman were important in getting together. Before we get there, Willie, while, while Chris was taking sort of the circuitous route to become a lawyer, um, you were interacting with lawyers and looking for a lawyer who could help you. It happens that a lot of the young people in the room are lawyers or are studying to become lawyers. And so I wondered, um, what do you wish all lawyers knew? I wish all lawyers would look at a case and understand whether the person is supposed to be guilty or whether he's not guilty. And a lawyer actually don't know that from, from the beginning. And it's going to take a while for you to talk to them, discuss and tell them situations and this and that. And that's what I did with Chris Mumar, she was writing, trying to find different things to try to help me and this and that. But she didn't never give up. And one thing I think 
It's very important to us that you really believe it in me. And anytime you get a lawyer, they have to believe in you before they really want to help you. In you. Because you can get a lot of lawyers that just take the case just to be paid. But that was a different thing with Chris. She took the case, wasn't looking for nothing out of it. Ran up on Dublin blocks four or five different times and didn't know where, know where else to go. She even said that she had to give up on the case because there was nothing else she could do. She said, but I tell you one thing, I never quit crying now. Find avenues to find somebody or some way to help you. And I kept telling her, you know, they might have defrauded all the evidence in my case, but they've got to have old fingerprints somewhere and they got to be on fire because they wasn't in my my fire. They defrauded everything that was in my fire. She went looking for that and this and that. Could never find it. She got in touch with you know, late later on. Had this inquiry commission to start up. That was one of the best things that ever happened for inmates in prison that not guilty or don't have any funds to pay people and this and that. So she got in touch with them, but. But a lawyer taking the case, they don't know which way the case is going to go or how it's going to go. Only thing they can do is promise you is they'll do the best they can. And when I came out, she got in touch with the innocent inquiry. And they had two people to come to see me. And we talked it and this and that. And right the day I feel like they had already looked it into my case before they came. But uh, they came, they were talking to me. One of them sitting in the courtroom right now. And I'm feel very, very proud of him because he went all out his way to do things to help me or find. And he told me point blank, if anything out there to be fine, I'm the man for you. He said, but if I catch you in one lie, I quit trying to help you or quit trying to prove your innocence. So one of the main things that you got to do is be honest with your lawyer, be faithful, and put trust in them that they gonna really try to do a job to help you instead of just doing a job for the money and get on back out. One of, go ahead. Can, I just want to, can I just add, add to something? Sure. First of all, I would point out Jamie Lau, who is- In case anyone wants to embarrass him later. Person who, anyway. who dug and dug and dug. Um, and I think Willie's exactly right, but I just want to expand on, on the whether someone is is guilty or innocent, the I think the the important thing to remember is that they're a person, and I think that's what gets lost in our justice system is that our justice system is about people. Um, when we have hearings, exoneration hearings, I've decided that the defendant should actually sit at the prosecution table because the prosecution just forgets that this is about a person's life and it becomes about the case and it becomes about the win or upholding the conviction. And so um, I think the most important thing is, even if they're guilty, there's, there's options, there's, there's reasons why something happened, there's things you can do to make a difference in the outcome. So keeping in mind that this is a human life and not a file is what's really important. A question for each of you. Willie, one of the terrible ironies of your story, and every book review, I think, has mentioned this. They all call it uh, Kafka-esque is that it has to do with something called a MAP contract. That's a mutual agreement parole program. 
it's a sort of stepladder of privileges that leads eventually to early parole. But there's a condition, which is that to qualify, you must sign a piece of paper taking responsibility for your crime and expressing remorse. You were offered this program uh, after about a decade in prison, and you refused it. You had been wrongly arrested, wrongly convicted, and we're looking at decades wrongly in prison. Why refuse a chance at early parole? Well, actually, what you refer to was not the MAP program. It was the SORT program. Sex SORT program is... SOAR, yes. SOAR. What's the separate? A sex offender something something. Anybody know? I don't know what that stands for. But in a way... A sort of prerequisite for the MAP program. The MAP is separate. MAP is the work program. I'm getting mixed up in my own story. MAP is the work program. SOAR is the sex for sexual offenders. Yes. Um, so this, Sorry, this yeah. as part of SOAR, you have to make an admission of guilt. Sorry, SOAR, not MAP. Too many acronyms. Yes. Go ahead. So the SOAR program, they came to me by, in 96, asking me to go to the SOAR program, but I would have to sign guilt to go to them. And they promised that they would let me out in six or seven months once I finished that program. So I told them I had to refuse the program because you had to sign papers saying that you were guilty of the crime that you did. And I was not going to do that. So every two years, they came to me with the same thing, offering me this sort program. So eventually, I told them that I'm not, I would go to the SALT program, but I wouldn't sign no paper saying I'm guilty of something I didn't do. Before I do that, I would die in there. So eventually, the MAP came, that's when the MAP came. The MAP is what you did eventually qualify this yeah, for, the SOAR is what you turned out. And the MAP would just allow you to go through different steps and get to work relief. And if you follow everything the map said, you would get out within two years. And that did not require an admission. That did not work. So I think SOAR is something like sexual offender admission and remorse or something like that. I think that. it's accountability and responsibility. Accountability. Yeah, it's coming to me. And, but he After lost that. 10 years. Yeah. Um, he would have been out 10 years sooner had he been willing to sign that agreement. And you, I, I had asked you before, um, I had mentioned this summit in 2002 of sort of top legal minds from around North Carolina. You were there and, in fact, uh, helped make it happen. Um, can you tell me about that? What was the thinking in getting all these people in a room? And uh, what did you expect the outcome might be? Um, so the people came to the room because of Justice Lake. Uh, if it had not been for I Beverly Lake's invitation, uh, nobody would have showed up. He was a uh, Republican, um, tough on crime, uh, and uh, the Chief Justice. So for him to send out an invitation to law enforcement and prosecutors and judges, um, and Jim Coleman, Teresa, myself, Rich Rosen, we were going to show up regardless. But to get those people to show up who are the ones that really can make change happen, um, it took the leadership of somebody who was seen as tough on crime, uh, pro-law enforcement. Um, and we didn't know what was going to come out of that meeting, honestly. We, it was a discussion of what we were seeing happening in cases such as Daryl Hunt and uh, Ronald Cotton and Leslie Jean, and there had been exoneration cases in North Carolina. And um, so one of the focused areas of the discussion was what, what leads to these people being wrongfully convicted, what can be done to prevent it, and how can we identify the cases sooner so they don't spend decades in prison? Uh, what's wrong with the current justice system that keeps it from being able to give relief uh, in, in an effective and efficient way? Um, and 
uh, Justice Lake really encouraged participation and, and talked about how important this was, kind of changing the message from being about just about the wrongfully convicted to being about the victims of crime not receiving justice, about the perpetrators, true perpetrators still being on the street. So kind of changing the marketing to be about being tough on crime and, and, and solving crimes by making sure the right person was behind bars. Um, so that meeting, um, that was in November of 2002, and it was, I think you know, we had a unanimous vote at that meeting to move forward with establishing the formal commission, which had its first meeting in February. And uh, during that meeting, we identified the, the topics we wanted to, to discuss as a commission, misidentification, false confessions, uh, preservation of biological evidence, the post-conviction uh, process for investigating innocence claims and where that process failed. Uh, and we identified our objectives for the work of the commission. It took several years, but in 2006, you guys founded this unprecedented state agency, the Innocence Inquiry Commission. Can you, I mean, before then, a lot of really smart, really talented, really well-meaning people had hoped to help Willie. The commission was able to do that in a way that no one else had been able to do. Can, can you explain in terms of resources what uh, the distinctions are, or the distinction is between a, a nonprofit doing really noble, virtuous work and an independent state agency? Sure. Um, I mean, the, the primary reasons for establishing the Innocence Inquiry Commission were, one, that the post-conviction process, there's a lot of procedural bars. So there's a lot of, if you could have raised this claim before, and when you filed something, then you can't raise it now when you file something. If, you know, if some evidence was available, if somebody had been doing their job at the time of trial, then you can't bring that evidence forward later. So there's a lot of procedural bars. Um, the other critical piece that's missing is access. Um, so you have very dedicated people in the justice system, like um, Professor Coleman Newman, and who who, if they could be given access to evidence rooms and to police files and prosecution files and had all the evidence in front of them, they could really do great things with a lot of cases. But uh, limited access, you can have the best attorney in the state or the country, and if they don't have access to the evidence, they're not going to do a good job uh, because they can't. Uh, and you can have a pretty average attorney who gets complete access who can do a very good job. So it really is about access, and that is what we gave the Innocence Inquiry Commission through the statutory law, was access to evidence rooms, access to files, access to what they needed to do a thorough investigation. Not to say that Jamie Lau is not a great investigator, but access helps. The commission, uh, you refer Willie's case to the commission, um, and it conducts the sort of investigation that you're describing with resources, with, with access that no one else was empowered to. And they found evidence that no one else was able to find. In fact, everyone else uh, repeatedly had been told was destroyed, no longer existed. The commission proved that wasn't the case and was able to recover it. And so Willie's case uh, goes through this, this process of the commission, and it leads to a hearing and then a three-judge panel in October of 2012. And Willie, we've done radio together now, so I've heard you ask this question and answer it, and I never get tired of your answer. So in, on October 5th, 2012, at this three-judge panel, the evidence is heard in full, really for the first time ever, including at your original trial. And uh, the verdict comes back, and a judge says, free at last, free at last, Willie J. Grimes is free at last. He really says this, which as a writer was a problem, because I thought readers are never going to believe that. <laughs> um, but that's what he said. What does that feel like? Well, it felt real good. I was real joyous. Felt like somebody had pulled a tub of water over my head, and the water was really hot, a little cold. It just made me feel like I was going to bust inside and want to cry, want to holler, and this and that. But 
so many people so grind I was trying to keep this and don't make my sister shame and don't make Miss Muma look dying good to hold in her head. So I was so sort of like what's happening so, right now. <laughs> <laughs> I was so happy and this and that. I wanted to jump up and shout and this and that. But I tried to stay calm as long as I could. But that, that's why I'm laughing thing. because he's talking about how he, all these feelings he had and when he was sitting in the court, he was sitting exactly like this, like. <laughs> so I didn't know all those things were going on inside of you. In, in terms of the need of a body em, empowered in the way Chris has described, um, everyone agrees that most people in prison are guilty. You spent 24 years there. Did you meet uh, other inmates in prison who you believed were innocent? Yes, I've met a few of them. We was on the same camp, Dad Hunt, Calvin, Calvin, uh, Calvin, uh, I met about six or seven that I really felt was innocent. Then again, it was about 10 or so saying they were really innocent, but every time they would tell me about it, they would tell me something different. Uh, tell me something that happened at the crime and this and that. So you listen at people's real close and good like that, which I think lawyers do. And you can tell whether they lying or whether they making up different stuff or not. And that's where you get your opinion from, whether you really believe they're innocent or not. But if a person know they innocent and going to lie just to get out or get some help, they hurting themselves because God is always looking at down at you and he always know what you have did and what you didn't do. And he would know that you was just lying just to get some more freedom. But like I told him two or three times, you know, I would rather die in there and have my dignity split a line and get out here and have the fall back on God. And then he pretend, looked down at me and said, well, you lied to get out of here. There's nothing I can do to help you. Chris, same question. Is there another Willie Grimes out there right now? Oh, there's absolutely Willie Grimes out there. And there's absolutely Willie Grimes out there that we cannot, even with all the access do anything about uh, you know when I talk to people about the work we do I always start with with the statement that uh, it's a fact that there are innocent people in prison and it's a fact that they will die there um, and that there's there's nothing that can be done now to fix that um, and that's really a, a, a burden for the justice system for everybody involved um, whenever we have a case like Willie's we, we ask them, you know, who do you know? What cases should we be looking at? Uh, and we get lists from them. And I don't know, if, I mean, I can't, I can't imagine that you're not sitting out there listening to Willie Grimes and thinking, how could anybody have thought this man would, was the person who committed a violent uh, assault and rape? And um, when we were working on his case, we tried to get the prosecutor, just come talk to him, come, come meet him come hear him, and they wouldn't do it. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I, there's, there's, a lot of, there's a lot of people out there. I wouldn't say they're, they're all like, this man is exceptional in many, many ways, um, but there's definitely innocent people in prison, and, and there's definitely cases where we can't, we can't fix that problem. I'd, we'd be happy to take some questions from folks. Um, uh, We can use the whole the old raise yeah. your hand thing too. Um, I'm, you know, I've got plenty of questions on my own. I can keep going. I'm a writer. <laughs> Does anyone have anything they want to ask? 
will accept hand raising. Yes. What kind of conversation do you have with your the, we're not going to talk about the details of the compensation. I just, you know, he did get some compensation. It's never adequate. Um, but why don't you tell people what you've been able to do, what you're doing with your life, um, that you do have some security in a home and things like that? Yes, I feel pretty good about myself right now. I have my own home, cars, everything paid for. But the uh, it don't take up for those 24 years that I lost. And while I was in there, I lost most of my whole family. I see I have a dear sister there. But missing all those things and this and that while being in prison, money wouldn't make up for it anyway. Don't care how much it is. The, um, and he's also had people come out of the woodwork, uh, people looking for, for him to help them after they found out he got compensation. I want to add something to after uh, what happened after Willie's exoneration. And um, you mentioned the, the small article in the paper after his exoneration, and, and Jamie pointed out earlier that some cases get a lot of coverage because of where they occur. If they're in Wake County, the News and Observer is going to do an article and it's going to get more coverage. Willie's case didn't get much coverage, um, but word should have been out within the county. And um, when he got out, he actually was out of prison for a year before his three-judge panel, but was a registered sex offender. And um, they tried to arrest him after his exoneration uh, for a violation of the, the registry. Um, so the county was not, was, did not take responsibility um, for what happened to Willie. They did not, uh, even though the judge ordered from the bench that he be removed from the registry right away, they did not follow up with that. Um, so the compensation is important for Willie, but what's really more important is what prosecutors and law enforcement do and, and respond, how they respond when one of these cases happens. And um, I don't know of a prosecutor or a group of law enforcement that has called together a study group to uh, identify how the, the case, how the wrongful conviction happened, make sure that their procedures are being changed, make sure they're addressing the problem. Uh, that's never happened. So, um, you know, I think we're probably going to have to demand as part of the civil litigation that that happen in these cases, because that's really what's going to move the system forward. Oh, actually, they move you around like that because you've been at one camp so long, everybody gets so new to you. And, uh, and uh, if there's any officers there that don't believe that you really get to this and that, they might go to doing your favors, tears, and then this and that. But I didn't ever do any kind of dealing or taking drugs or nothing like that. So. There wasn't no reason for any time that you go to feeling at home like like you haven't got any care. They move you so that they can make it more hard and rough on you to make you start all over again. As I recently, <clears throat> excuse me, as I was finishing the book, I, I was going back through and looking at notes i have written to myself all through, and I found a note that made me laugh from the very beginning before we had ever met. I had written in a notebook to myself, um, try to visit prison where Willie spent 24 years at. <laughs> and it made me laugh at how dumb it was and how naive because, in fact, he had been bounced around among 20-odd prisons uh, weeks or months or years at a time, and I... I uh, thankfully had lost that note and then found it and thought, thank God I'm smarter than this now. <laughs> and we have to check, um, even if we, we're sending a, an update letter, we have to check uh, where, the, where they are because they, they, they get moved all the time.
I was tired of, I think that's a really thoughtful question. I was tired of seeing headlines. You know, every so often you see in a newspaper this uh, headline, you know, man, usually it's a man, exonerated. And, and there's always that photo of the attorney and the guy sort of with their hands up. And um, it always included name, crime, and duration, how long he'd spent in prison. And I, I had always thought, this is an incredible human experience. I can't believe that's all they're telling us. And so part of my goal in the book was to give a sort of intimate, up close, private look at what this means to the people involved on both sides of the conversation you're, you're describing. I think I'm, I'm not going to, I haven't read the book. I'm not going to read the book. I, I didn't know my letters were in the book. Um, so, um, but I think probably my letters, what my letters showed was that I recognized this was a person. And so that's the same thing I talked about before. The system has changed. Investigations have changed. Um, but the one thing that, that I mean, there's still improvement to do. No, don't get me wrong. But the one thing that individuals have to recognize is their own biases and their own um, defense attorneys become cynical just like prosecutors do. They, you know, their clients come in. Most of them are guilty. They get cynical. They, they just decide the plea is the easy way. Uh, prosecutors get cynical, and people um, have biases and, and make subconscious decisions about where, the way a case should go, and you have to recognize those. And, and to recognize those, you really do have to read about it, learn about it, and, and practice how to prevent it. So that would be the biggest piece of advice I could give to you. May, may I add selfishly that the reason you haven't read the book has nothing to do with the quality of the book. Now, I know the writer and it's, you know, whatever. You don't have to get into it, but there are, there are other personal reasons that I just want to make sure. <laughs> One more? Sure. So, so the Innocence Inquiry Commission does not look at any reform issues. It only looks at cases and investigates cases and, and doesn't do any policy work. The, the study commission that we were all members of looked at the causation issues, and that's how we ended up with ID reform and recording of interrogations and stronger preservation of evidence laws. Um, Justice Lake had mandatory retirement in 2006, and when the new chief justice came in, as what happens is they don't want to follow in the old chief justice's footsteps. They want to establish their own legacy. And the commission stopped meeting under that chief justice um, leadership. We are currently trying to get the current, the new chief justice, one, uh, one uh, again, to take this issue up. Because there is so much to, to be done when you can pull everybody from, with the different perspectives to the table. And, uh, and try and get them to listen to the other perspectives and come to agreement on a common goal. And that's what we were able to do. And so there's a lot more work to be done. Um, the, 
the problem in Willie's case, Dwayne Dale's case, Greg Taylor's case, Joseph Sledge's case, um, was um, they don't know what they have. <laughs> they, so uh, evidence rooms don't know what's in there. Uh, police don't know what's in their files. Uh, officers would take files home with them after they, they left the force. Um, so control and organization of, uh, of evidence and documents is critical to going back and, and, and looking at these cases. And there have been some departments, um, primarily because of civil litigation, that have, that have fixed their procedures. But there's a lot more that can be done in that area. Um, we currently have a bill pending. We're going to get this out there. It's at House Bill 216. Um, and it is a bill about jailhouse informants, increasing reliability of jailhouse informants through recording of, uh, recording of interviews and establishing a study committee to look at the Innocence Inquiry Commission process and see what's working and what's not. Because it was a new process and it, it, can, it needs some improving. And so that bill would establish a committee to, to study the process and discuss changes. Um, it's been a, a pleasure to spend some time with you guys. And I know many of you have classes and you got to dash off. I want to give Willie the last word. Um, what, is there anything you want to leave these guys and girls with? Women. Uh, sorry? Women. women. Men and women with <laughs> as uh, they sort of go about not only their day, but their work. A lot of them are becoming lawyers. Most I would like to say I'm glad to see all you all here. Just to show how interest a lot of people's ears about how things go, what's going on. And I'm very glad to be here. But even though, like, a lot of times, you look around, you never know who around or how they feel or what they think. And when it come to something like this, it really made me feel good to see as many people here to listen or try to get the understanding or, or try to put themselves in my place and try to feel the way I should be feeling or might be feeling. I'm just happy to see all you all here. Thanks for being here. Thank you so much. There are copies of the book outside for those of you who don't have class immediately after and would like to pick up a copy. I would definitely encourage you to do so. Um, thank you again for coming and thank you all for being here.